Welcome everyone to our Pediatric Hospital Medicine Podcast. Again, my name is Dr. Tony Tarcici. I'm coming to you from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC. And as a reminder, this podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. As I promised last time, this podcast is going to focus on osteomyelitis. Specifically, we're going to narrow it down to acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. Now, our format today is going to be a little bit different from my last podcast. Today, I'm going to review the topic myself, and at the latter half of the podcast, I'm going to ask our consultant who is here, who I'll introduce then, the questions we may have as a group. First, let's do housekeeping issues. Um, I have no conflict of interest, as I had no conflict of interest last time. Hopefully one day I will. I'm an assistant professor at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC at the Paul C. Gaffney Diagnostic Referral Group. If you listened to my last podcast, you learned a lot about what we do. But in short, the majority of what we do is in pediatric hospital medicine. I'm also MedPeds trained in case any of you out there want to know. Now. Because of the October, late October 2016 ruling by the American Board of Medical Specialties that pediatric hospital medicine will now be a board certified specialty, this topic is going to become even more important because there's a chance this specific area may show up on the board certification exam which is yet to be announced. So I'm going to start, especially because we may have house staff listening at some point, with a basic overview of osteomyelitis, and then we'll get into a little bit more in detail. Our large focus on this podcast is going to be treatment. We're going to dive into the long IV versus PO debate for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. Also going to discuss PICC lines for a brief time, so let's begin. I always like to start with a definition so we're all on the same page. So osteomyelitis is a bacterial infection of the bone. The reason this topic is important, the reason we're doing this, is because approximately 1 in 5,000 children under the age of 13 is diagnosed with osteomyelitis each year in the USA. It does account for about 1% of all pediatric hospitalizations. And these infections, as you all know if you're listening, have the potential to cause permanent disability and even death if not caught and treated appropriately. The epidemiology of disease favors toddlers and young children. About 30% of the total cases occur in children by two years old and 50% by age five. Males greater than females by about a two to one ratio. In children, the most common cause of acute osteomyelitis is acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. Different papers and different sources put a timeline on what is acute versus subacute versus chronic. Most people agree that acute hematogenous osteomyelitis is defined as an infection of the bone or bone marrow diagnosed within two weeks from the onset of signs and symptoms. Now, there may be debate on the timing of that. I'll give you my references for that one. The Lancet 2004 article called Osteomyelitis, issue 364, by Lou D.P. et al. Uh, Expert review uh, anti-infectious therapy. 2010, an article called Management of Acute Hematogenous Osteomyelitis in Children by Harrick N.S. and Smeltzer et al. And the last one by our Finnish friends we're going to meet, um, Antibiotic Treatment for Acute Hematogenous Osteomyelitis of Childhood Moving Towards Shorter Courses in Oral Administration by M. Pakayan. And again, as I always tell you, if I butcher these names, and especially the Finnish names, I may, I'm going to apologize now from the beginning for all of them, and H. Peltola et al. Anyway, so other ways in which bacteria reach a bone besides hematogenous spread are direct spread from an adjacent infected soft tissue or joint, direct inoculation during trauma, or a surgical procedure. All right, so if you haven't turned me off, which I think most of you have by now, I'm going to break this up with jokes. Again, this is a podcast. I don't have a PowerPoint to put up a funny picture or a meme, so I'm going to use jokes. And so because I think they're funny, I'm going to use uh, corny dad jokes. So here's joke number one. Four, six, eight, and nine have all been killed. Two, three, five, seven, and 11 are all the prime suspects. <laughs> okay, let's talk about briefly the, the clinical manifestations of osteomyelitis. 
The, clini the clinical manifestations are age dependent. We'll start with neonates. They can exhibit pseudoparalysis or pain with limb movement. And half of neonates do not have fever and may not even appear ill. Remember also about neonates and young infants, there are trans transphysial blood vessels, which, and my wife already corrected me about this, which connect the metaphysis and epiph epiphys epiphysis. So it's common for pus or period material from the metaphysis to enter the joint space. Now, older, ch older infants and children are more likely to have fever, pain, localizing signs like edema, erythema, or warmth. With involvement of lower extremities, limp or refusal to walk is seen in approximately half of patients. And focal tenderness, which is in my old program and uh, where I trained, focal tenderness over a long bone is an imp important finding. And I was taught it was a pathognomonic finding. So I'll give a shout out to Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, everyone's still up there in Newark. So let's talk about which bones are commonly affected. Now, different papers had different numbers. But all of them really agreed that the majority of sites for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis are the femur, the tibia, and the humerus. Which ones are one, two, and three is adjusted or a little bit different in every paper, but those are always the top three. And going back to the beginning, Nelson's textbook of pediatrics says the tibia is the most common, then the femur, followed by the humerus to round up the top three. And the, those three make up about 60% of where osteomyelitis will normally be, and most papers agree with that. All right, now diagnosis. And we're almost through this part, then we're gonna get into the treatment. First of all, if you suspect osteomyelitis, you should always get a blood culture. According to one paper, this wasn't by our friends uh, Pacayon, an inter international journal of antimicrobial agents in 2011, called Antibiotic Treatment for Acute Hematogenous Osteomyelitis with Childhood Mounding Moving towards shorter courses, 40% of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis is only blood culture positive, which I thought was only was surprising, but that's what they said. And most, and most textbooks, papers are in the 40, 50% for osteomyelitis. Classically, people have gotten CBC with diff, ESR, and CRP. And usually ESR and CRP can be elevated above 20 each respectively. And what we're going to talk about later is how that was used for treatment, which we'll get to. For imaging, remember that x-rays will typically not show lytic changes in tubular long bones for 7 to 14 days after the onset of infection. Flat and irregular bones can take even longer. The three-phase bone scan has a sensitivity of 84 to 100 percent and a specificity of 70 to roughly 96 percent, which is a big range. In hematogenous osteomyelitis and can detect osteomyelitis within 24 to 48 hours after the onset of symptoms. Sensitivity in neonates, remember, for the three-phase bone scan is much lower owing to poor min bone mineralization. Now there are advantages to the three-phase bone scan because they often need less sedation and cost less than MRI, which brings up our best radiographic imaging technique, MRI with gadolinium. This is the test of choice and it differentiates very well between abscesses and between bone and soft tissue infections, which brings up your differential diagnosis. Your differential diagnosis for osteomyelitis is leukemia, neuroblastoma with bone involvement, primary bone tumors, but most often remember the bone tumors don't have fever and other signs of illness except for Ewing sarcoma, trauma, accidental or non-accidental, sweet syndrome, and pyoderma gangrenosum. So the organisms, we're almost through, I promise everybody. Most common bacterium which cause osteomyelitis is by far Staph aureus in all age groups. Depending upon what you read, community-acquired MRSA accounts for roughly 25 to 50% of all Staph osteomyelitis. Now, remember, we're going to discuss briefly, just for board purposes and rapid review purposes, there are other bacteria you have to worry about depending upon specific circumstances. So if you want to discuss neonates again, Remember, GBS and gram-negative bacteria are more common in that age group than others. In children older than six, streptococcus is the second most common after staph. Other organisms which can cause acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. For sickle cell patients, you must think of salmonella and strep pneumo. They're encapsulated. For nosocomial infections, pseudomonas is the most common. There's, of course, haemophilus influenza and coag-negative staph in the right patient. Kingella kinge is something that was really popular about five years ago. We saw it a lot. Uh, from what I have found, it's mostly primarily in subacute hematogenous osteomyelitis in kids. That was a paper written in a, a journal of child orthopedics in 2016 by um, Sirenopoulou et al. But we're going to talk to our guest about that in a little bit. Now, 
There's no good place for me to talk about the IDSA guidelines in this talk. So I'm going to put it in now, and then we're going to move right into treatment. So first, the IDSA MRSA guidelines for osteomyelitis, they were updated in January 2011, and it is a small part of the MRSA guidelines. And they're a little vague. So first, they talk about the optimal route of IV versus PO has not been established. Then the discussion becomes which antibiotics should and could be used. They tell you Vanco and Dapto or IV, Bactrim, and, Bactrim with Rifampin, can be IV changed to PO. Linezolid and Clinda can be IV then changed to PO. Then they talk about the optimal duration of therapy for MRSA osteomyelitis. It's, they say unknown. A minimum of eight week course is recommended by them. Some experts may recommend an additional one to three months, they say. There is a specific section on that for pediatric osteomyelitis and MRSA, the MRSA guidelines. And what they say is for MRSA osteo and septic arthritis, vancomycin is recommended unless if the patient's stable without ongoing bacteremia or intravascular infection, Clinda can be used as empiric therapy if the Clinda resistance rate locally is less than 10%. Then it makes it easy to transition to oral if the strain is susceptible. That's a lot of ifs. So more on MRSA because we're going to talk about that for a little bit. One study there was done found that MRSA, children with MRSA infections had a higher presenting CRP, longer inpatient hospital stays, multiple surgical procedures, increased complications, and more frequent admission to the ICU. Another report noted increased inflammatory markers, like we just said, larger, longer hospital stays, and more surgical procedures. Due to the fact that MRSA seems to be a more virulent infection, especially than MSSA for the bones, and the increased prevalence of community-acquired MRSA that has been going on, there has been interest in creating the scoring system for severity of illness for children with acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. The most recent paper, and I read a few of these, is from the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics in 2016 by Alexander Atley et al. called Validation and Modification of the, a Severity of Illness Score for Children with Acute Hematogenous Osteomyelitis. As of the moment I'm recording this, there is no good, no good scoring systems that have been proven to be helpful in predicting severity of illness in children with acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. That paper I just told you about, they found it was not that helpful. All right, now we're going to get into treatment. And this is where we're going to spend the bulk of the rest of our time. So historically in the U.S., children with acute hematogenous osteomyelitis were discharged from the hospital with long-term parenteral IV antibiotics through a PICC line. Now, PICC lines were initially used because this was in, it was easy to use them. Once you placed them, they could stay in for the whole time. The patient could get it out when antibiotics were completed. Plus, there was an unsurety or an uncomfortableness with how much, or better put, if enough of an oral antibiotic got absorbed to treat and get into the bone infection. Now, before we go further, we need to establish, and we're going to talk about it in a couple more papers, that PICC lines in general have risk associated with them and are not safe devices. When did all this change? It changed in 1997. In 1997, a Finnish study by the uh, uh, people whose names I'm sure I'm butchering, Peltola et al., the Finnish study group, and it was called Simplified Treatment of Acute Staph Osteomyelitis of Childhood. It was in pediatrics in 1997. It challenged the norm. This was just a case series from Finland with staph aureus osteomyelitis that showed excellent outcomes with early transition to oral antibiotic therapy after normalization of the CRP levels. And that's going to be the key because that's going to come up again. Now, there have been other studies which supported this IV to PO switch. The one, the next one I want to discuss is in pediatrics in 2015. The dates I'm going to, the studies of the dates I'm going to discuss are a little out of order. This one was from Karen et al., pediatrics 2015, comparative effectiveness of IV versus PO for post-discharge treatment of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. This was a retrospective cohort study. It used the FIS database, and for those of you unfamiliar, FIS, P-H-I-S, stands for Pediatric Health Information Systems. For this study, they've used 38 hospitals, and the dates were from January 1, 2009 to 12 31, 2012. They validated data by having local phys physicians in the hospital and or trained research assistants from those specific hospitals perform a detailed review of the medical record. 
Now, before we talk about what the study found, we should review the exclusion criteria because that's important. Now, I'm going to just lay it out. The exclusion criteria for all these studies are extensive. The exclusion criteria for this study was hospitalized in, in the six months preceding the index admission with an ICD-9 diagnosis code of acute, unspecified, or chronic osteomyelitis. Had a concurrent or previous ICD-9 code for a chronic cardiac, hematologic, immunologic, oncologic, or respiratory condition that would increase the child's risk for treatment failure with either treatment modality. Were not admitted through the hospital ED. So anyone that came from a transfer was excluded from an outside hospital transfer. Were transferred to another facility. Those patients were also excluded. Had other specified sites of osteomyelitis. Had a length of stay less than 2 or greater than 14 days. Remember, this goes back to our definition of acute. They used the same definition of acute. So this is important in terms of your treat, your patients you choose to treat, because if you're going to use these studies, you must know which patients you cannot use it on. The inclusion criteria are very simple. The lad, at least two months old, younger than 18, on a date of admission, and were discharged between January 1st, 2009 and 12 31, 2012. The outcome, primary outcome measure, was treatment failure, which sounds easy, but it is not. So their explanation of treatment failure was defined as a revisit to the emergency department or a rehospitalization for a change in the antibiotic regimen or its dosage, prolongation of antibiotic treatment, conversion from the oral to the pick root, bone abscess drainage, debridement of necrotic bone, bone biopsy, drainage of abscess of the skin of skin or muscle, arthrocentesis, or diagnosis of a pathologic fracture. That was considered treatment failure. Secondary outcomes included a return to the ED or rehospitalization for an adverse drug reaction, which they defined as vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, C. diff infection, allergic reaction, urticaria, anaphylaxis, drug-induced neutropenia, acute kidney injury, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, erythema multiforme, or another. A PIC complication, which was defined as a fever, evaluation, infection, at the site of the PIC insertion, bloodstream infection, sepsis and thrombosis, or thrombosis, breakage, repair, adjustment of the PIC, manipulation of the PIC, or removal of the PIC line with or without insertion of a new line. So that's how we set the study up. Looks good, seems thorough. But what happened, well, let's get to that, but first we'll do another corny dad joke. A ham sandwich walks into a bar and orders a beer. Bartender says, sorry, we don't serve food here. So in the end, there was about 2,060 kids from the 36 hospitals were included in the final cohort of the study. It was nearly evenly divided between children discharged to a complete course of oral antibiotics, which is about 1,005, versus a course of IV antibiotics delivered via PIC, about 1,055. The numbers show the rates of treatment failure were nearly identical in the oral therapy and PIC groups. Those rates of treatment failure were 5% in the oral therapy failed and 6% in the PIC group failed. This is important because those numbers are not statistically significant, but I believe they're clinically significant. This showed the oral therapy actually had a lower rate of treatment failure by 1%. And 1% 1 of 1,000 is roughly 10 kids, which is not a small number. All right, the range. So when we talk about the treatment, it, it was a transition to PO, early transition to PO. So their timing they used was two to four days, which actually matched with most of the other, most of the other studies, which means when the patient was first admitted, they got approximately two to four days of IV therapy, then switched to oral, and that was the group that had a lower treatment failure rate. The rates of adverse drug reactions were lower, were low in both groups, less than 4%, but greater in the PIC group, 3.8%, in a cross-hospital, within-hospital matched analysis. Of the 1,055 kids in the PIC group, 158 children, 15%, had a PIC-related complication that required an ED visit, which was 96 of them, a re-hospitalization, which was 38 of them, or both, which was 24 of them. So in case you were wondering or following, that's a high number, and that was higher than other studies that showed PIC that had PIC complications, but all of the studies showed PIC complications by a reasonable amount. So this really tells you 
Picks are not benign instruments and are fraught with potential complications, so they need to be chosen for the right patient. So this was the first study I read that really showed that PO therapy was as effective as PIC line therapy and probably a little bit better and safer. All right, next one. This one is by Peltola and Pekion, our Finnish friends. And it's December 2016, the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal, Volume 29, called Short vs. Long-Term Antimicrobial Treatment for Acute Hematogenous Osteomyelitis of Childhood. It's a prospective randomized trial on 131 culture-positive cases. So, there were 131 culture-positive cases of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis taken from 1983 to 2005 from seven referral hospitals in Finland. The primary endpoint was full recovery, having no signs or symptoms of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis at the end of the follow-up period. The visits for the follow-up were two weeks, three months, six months and 12 months post-hospitalization. And no readministration of antimicrobial for an osteoarticular indication since the primary treatment. Secondary outcomes included all potential sequelae and the absence of disease after stoppage of antimicrobial therapy. Now, the interesting part about this study is it was not done to prove IV versus PO. This was the person that originally decided that PO was better so this was deciding on how long for PO. All of the patients in this got early transition to PO, and they all actually did well. And what they did was an x-ray at, at day 10 and 19, an initial CBC, CRP, and ESR on day of presentation and days 5 and 10. The CRP and ESR were measured sequentially throughout the illness. The antibiotic was stopped when the signs and symptoms had subsided and the CRP was less than 20 milligrams per liter. Now, as a caveat, this group was in Finland at the time and they had less MRSA than we would in the U.S. But it did show that using CRP as a surrogate marker, a long physical exam could work. Again, all the patients got two to four days of IV therapy and then were transitioned to PO. And there was a 20-day group and a 30-day group for treatment length. The short-term group, the 20-day group, and the 30-day group, there was absolutely no difference in terms of the primary outcomes. They were exactly the same. So this is a pretty good study. The next one, we're going to go back to talking about IV versus PO. And this is one of my final ones. So there's not that much more left. Prolonged IV therapy versus orally transition to oral antimicrobial therapy for acute osteomyelitis in children. Done in pediatrics in 2009, volume 123 by Dr. Zautis and Localio et al. Again, this is a retrospective cohort study comparing the use of early transition to oral versus prolonged IV antimicrobial therapy. This is in a large sample of kids hospitalized and treated for acute osteomyelitis. This is in 29 freestanding children's hospitals in the U.S. They used the FIS database as well. The kids included were ages 2 months, 17 years, with discharge dates between January 1, 2000, and June 30, 2005. They were included if their ICD-9 diagnosis code was for acute osteomyelitis or unspecified osteomyelitis in any of the 21 diagnostic diagnosis fields. The exclusion criteria, so the exclusion criteria again are big. So children with a hospitalization for chronic osteomyelitis in the six months before the index admission were excluded. Those with congenital and acquired immunodeficiency, sickle cell disease, trauma, Osteomyelitis associated with immobilization or pressure ulcers like spina bifida, quadriparaplegic patients, mechanical ventilation and postoperative infections, and osteomyelitis of the head, face, and orbits, and anyone with malabsorption syndrome, which was the, this was the first paper to include those patients. They also excluded children with a whole slew of conditions which would have increased the risk of sub subsequent complications of osteomyelitis, like cellulitis, pyoderma, pyo pyogenic arthritis, arthropathy, congenital or acquired bone diseases, fasciitis, and postoperative wounds. Finally, kids with less than six months of follow-up of after the initial osteomyelitis were also excluded. Kids were placed, obviously, in one of two possible categories, prolonged IV or early PO transition. The prolonged IV group was defined by the presence of a procedure code, 38.93, which was the venous catheterization code, not elsewhere classified. The assignment groups were validated by using a 10% random sample of the cohort from 19 to 29 hospitals who agreed to participate. 
Primary outcome, again, was treatment failure. This they defined as a rehospitalization within six months with assigned diagnosis or procedure codes which were consistent with acute osteomyelitis, sole diagnosis, chronic osteomyelitis, a potential complication of osteomyelitis like myositis, arthritis, etc., a surgical procedure related to the musculoskeletal systems. Secondary outcomes include rehospitalization within six months for any reason, catheter-related complications, adverse drug reactions associated with antibiotics, and they mentioned specifically C. diff infection or agranulocytosis, which is seen in beta lactams. 6,348 children initially had the diagnosis code. And after they applied all their exclusionary criteria, you got about 1,969 kids left in the study. Of that 1,969, 1,021 had a PICC line placed for prolonged IV therapy, and 948 did not and were assigned to the oral antimicrobial therapy group. The two groups were virtually identical in terms of demographics, length of stay, site of infection, infecting organism, again, staph aureus was the most common, surgical intervention, in-hospital antimicrobial therapy, and disease severity as measured by the case mix index. In this study, the treatment failure rate was 5%, 54 of 121, in 1,021 in the prolonged IV group and 4% in the oral therapy group. And there was no statistical significance between the two, but again, this is another study showing a 1% decrease in treatment failure using the oral early transition to oral group. 3% or 35 children in the prolonged IV treatment group were readmitted for an, a catheter-related complication. The rate of antimicrobial complication was significantly higher in the prolonged IV therapy group. Now, you're, you're probably saying, why does this group have a 3%, the other group at a 15%? I think the other group, the other paper we talked about, their definition of a pic related complication was a little bit broader. Still, this group had a high one. Okay. The overall six-month rehospitalization rate, which included hospitalizations for any reason, like treatment failure, catheter complication, was significantly higher in the IV group, 10% for the IV group for a 6% in the oral group. Now, gone through a lot. Assuming, let's say for a second, you wanted to read an article um, on this and you didn't want to just take my word for it and you wanted to pick one that would summarize what's been going on in the literature for, in terms of this debate and read it, I have one for you. And I'm just going to tell you what it is. It's called Choosing Wisely, Things We Do for No Reason. Prolonged IV instead of oral antibiotics for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis in children. Written by James Wood and David Johnson. It's in the Journal of Hospital Medicine, Volume 11, Number 7, in July of 2016. If you really only have one article to read, I suggest it. I think it's an excellent article, summarizes the debate very, very well, and I actually really enjoyed it. Now, at this point, I would like to introduce our guest to you. So I would like to thank him for his patience up till now. So he is Dr. Michael Green, MD, MPH. He's a professor of pediatric surgery and clinical and translational science at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and in the Division of Infectious Diseases, Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship and Infection Prevention and Co-Director of the Transplant Infectious Diseases here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and one of my colleagues. Mike, thank you for coming. Thanks. It's my pleasure. Um, I guess I could do the housekeeping right now. Yes. I have no conflict of interest to report. All right. Thank you. Now, we're going to start with questions, and to get these questions, I actually polled my group, the diagnostic group, and I uh, picked up questions from everybody because I didn't want it to just be me. So the first question I have seems to be the most obvious one. As an infectious disease attending, when do you want to be called or consulted on these patients? And even more specifically, I'm going to break it down into two separate questions. For pediatric acute hematogenous osteomyelitis in one of the long bones, in a patient without any of the exclusionary criteria that we discussed, do you want to be consulted? So let me just begin by uh, thanking you, Tony, for allowing me to participate. I very much enjoyed your review of the literature and your efforts <clears throat> at the pronunciation of our Finnish colleagues and my friend Theo Zaudis at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So let me say the following, that for most cases of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis, it's my opinion that they do require infectious disease input, both uh, for acute decision-making as well as for subsequent outpatient management and follow-up. For the former, 
The PEDS ID specialist can provide expert advice regarding the evaluation of the patient, antimicrobial options, and decisions about the possibility and timing of transitioning from IV to oral therapy. For the latter, the PEDS ID specialist can provide continuity support for the family, including working with home health care providers for those sent home on IV antibiotics, tracking of sequential labs followed uh, to assess response to therapy, and also tracking for potential side effects of medications, and to assure that the child's clinical course is as expected. Involvement of the PEDS ID specialist is particularly important for those children who will go home on IV antibiotics and for those in whom orthopedics have had a minimal involvement. Finally, for programs where the pediatric hospitalist does not typically provide ongoing outpatient follow-up, involvement of the PEDS ID specialist is critical to assure the appropriate management of a child after hospitalization. So then I'm going to assume for more complex cases like facial osteomyelitis or a patient who meets the exclusionary criteria we talked about, you absolutely want to be consulted. Yeah, I think that's correct. So I think it's very important for the PEDS ID specialist to be involved in those cases of osteomyelitis that are more complex or that will require longer durations of therapy. This is uh, particularly, or the latter is particularly true, as it's not uncommon to see children develop drug-induced bone marrow suppression, which requires consideration of switching to alternative drugs and routes in the outpatient setting. The PEDS ID consultant should always be consulted for cases of osteomyelitis due to MRSA. Uh, uh, that's due to the propensity for slow response and, as you've mentioned earlier in the podcast, for the increased likelihood of complications, as well as the challenges in managing ant antimicrobials used for the treatment of MRSA, particularly things like vancomycin where trackling levels uh, and adjusting them in the outpatient setting can be really very complex. Thank you for that. So one of the things I like this podcast for is uh, areas where uh, we, as, you know, when we consult you guys, we're, sometimes we're not sure what you're doing or, or why you're doing what you're doing. And I think us having a conversation is helpful. And this is one of the things, this is one of those questions. So one of the cloudy areas for me is how you decide how long to treat these patients. What's the length of therapy? Do you use the CRP and follow like, the studies we discussed? Or do you use different criteria? So, you know, it, it was in some ways interesting to me to hear you talk about the relatively recent study of 20 versus uh, 30 days. Actually, uh, going back to my training uh, in pediatric infectious disease, 1986 to 1989, the, the duration of treatment that I was taught remains the duration of treatment that I recommend to this day. Um, and in general, we believe, uh, my colleagues in infectious disease, the people who train me, the people I've talked about this uh, with outside of our institution, that, um, that treatment is defined by uh, whether you consider something to be acute, subacute, or chronic osteomyelitis. For the purpose of this uh, podcast, we're focusing on acute osteomyelitis. And what I will say is that our current practice is to treat acute osteomyelitis for a minimum of 21 days and until a SED rate is less than 20. We use the SED rate and not the C-reactive protein because we know that it's slower to normalize and it's a conservative decision. In fact, um, back when I was a fellow, our former division chief, a man named uh, Richard Michaels, had done a sabbatical in England and came back with the idea of using the C-reactive protein as they were using in Europe. And my then attending uh, instructors all uh, voted him down because the concern would be that you might discontinue antibiotics earlier than necessary, which could predispose to late sequela chronic osteomyelitis. And I do want to make one additional comment in response to some of the papers that you talked about, and that chronic osteomyelitis is something which we rarely see today as a sequela of, of incomplete or absent treatment. But when it used to occur, particularly in the pre-antibiotic era, it could, re it could occur decades after the original infection. Accordingly, the studies that you referred to on this podcast, even those with follow-up at one year, one could be a bit concerned, although the likelihood is relatively remote, that late cases of chronic osteos might develop 
long, long after the follow-up for the given clinical study was completed. In any case, we have intentionally decided to use the sedimentation rate and have continued to use that as our basis for discontinuation of therapy. So a minimum duration of 21 days and until the sed rate normalizes. I will say that there are some children in whom the sedimentation rate seems to get stuck. And in those cases, if they've had a minimum of three to five weeks of therapy, they have excellent clinical response, and at that point, a C-reactive protein is completely normal. We will discontinue the antibiotic despite the fact that the sed rate may not have fully normalized. This does happen in some cases, but um, I'd say in the majority of cases, they're going to be treated for three to five weeks and the sed rate is going to completely normalize. Okay. That's interesting. So then maybe a case series later on, a decade or so from now on, those kids would be helpful to see if any of them develop chronic osteomyelitis. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the case, and, and the incidence might be exceptionally low, um, and it might not just be one decade. It might be two decades. It might be three decades, which is why there is some concern. So then really the only place that could or potentially take place is somewhere like Finland, where everybody is tracked with the electronic medical record and you have access forever. Yeah, I think that that, you know, having a, a captured population in whom you can do late long-term follow-up really um, provides an opportunity to do outcomes-based research on a populational basis that can provide the information in a way that would not be pragmatic in any clinical trial um, that one might uh, try to enroll patients in. Okay. So now, do you think at this point this issue of IV versus oral, early transition to oral versus IV therapy fully for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis is finished. Do you feel the over literature is overwhelmingly on one side? So I want to make a, a comment, and then I'll and then I'll answer your question. Okay. So you know it's it's interesting um, that that you spoke of the this concern of whether it's safe to go to IV therapy. But you know we didn't used to have pick lines. So again, back in a previous century when I was doing my training and I was a young faculty member, PICC lines were not available and patients were sent home on oral therapy with some frequency. At, at that time, we would often try to um, test uh, a sample of their blood after they had taken an oral antibiotic. We would then uh, draw blood and measure the uh, bacterial cytal activity of the level that they were able to achieve. Some centers would use um, a staph aureus that they kept in the uh, uh, micro lab if they didn't have their own organism available. Our center typically liked to do this for patients in whom we had their own organism so that we could prove that their organism was susceptible to their level of antibiotic. But even in those days, often the orthopedic group, when they didn't consult us, would put them on oral therapy without bothering to do a serum cytal level and send them home on oral antibiotics because they didn't want to keep them in the hospital for three weeks on IVs, and they seemed to do fine. Then PICC lines became universally available, and everybody was getting them because it seemed logically outcomes must be better, and you could certainly get the children out of the hospital more quickly because you didn't have to wait for a period of time for them to get a good clinical uh, and laboratory uh, response. Subsequently, after PICC line use had become nearly universal, our friends in Finland and in Scandinavia, I think, really began to raise the question of did this really make sense? And I believe at this time that um, there is uh, universal acceptance that the literature is overwhelming in favor of using two to four days of IV therapy followed by oral uh, antibiotic for um, most cases of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. And um, I think that there will be potentially some uh, exceptions to this, but in general, that when one looks at the cost and the additional issues of risk associated with IV antibiotic through a PICC line, that, uh, and the fact that there have not been uh, evidence that in the vast majority of cases proven enhancement in outcome, and in fact, as you quoted, perhaps there was even less good outcomes, although 
one percent is not statistically different, but I understand your your comments about that could be ten cases or twenty cases out of a thousand. I believe that there um, at this time this is no longer uh, in debate. Although one has to still consider that there are other cases where this may not make sense. So patients with more complicated disease, and particularly those patients who have um, community acquired uh, MRSA infections, those that were persistently bacteremic with their MRSA, but perhaps with MSSA as well, those that required recurrent uh, trips to the operating room where uh, source control may have been uh, more difficult to achieve, may benefit for uh, a longer course of IV therapy. But even in them, many of the cases can be uh, safely and appropriately transitioned to oral therapy. Another caveat that our group uses is that for some of the children in whom we predict that they are at greater risk for a suboptimal outcome, we may recommend uh, completing the course of therapy on IV, or at least providing them a long course of IV before making the transition, so there cannot be a doubt that the outcome was attributable to a management decision of going to oral therapy uh, too early. How do you decide who you think would have a suboptimal outcome? Well, I think those patients in whom uh, the infection clearly involves uh, the growth plate and where the risk of leg length discrepancy might be greater are potential candidates for um, uh, long IV therapy. I will say that there aren't data to say that that would lead to a, a decreased likelihood of, of that sequelae. But again, um, if uh, a patient were to experience that, it would be clear that no one could attribute that less than perfect outcome to, uh, to the decision to go to oral therapy. And as I've already mentioned, I think those cases that are MRSA, particularly those with persistent bacteremia um, and uh, recurrent trips to the, um, to the operating room, probably are going to get longer courses of therapy, although I don't think they're going to get their entire eight-week course of IV ther as IV therapy, but rather they may get two or three or four weeks of course of therapy, and when they have excellent e evidence of clinical response, then have uh, the remainder of their course if you will, mopped up using oral therapy. Okay. Now, the next question I have came from other members of the group. Um, the issue of interventional radiology versus orthopedics consistently comes up, at least in our hospital, and I know other hospitals. Orthopedic surgery attests that the literature supports, and the literature does support using interventional radiology first due to decreased scar, easier healing. But when do you think orthopedics should be con consulted versus when should interventional radiology be consulted? So I think it's important uh, for you and for our listeners to recognize that the role of the orthopedic surgeon in the care of the child with osteomyelitis is not necessarily limited to obtaining a bone specimen for culture and histology. Children who develop osteomyelitis are at risk for late sequelae, and as I mentioned earlier, one that we talk about is leg length discrepancies, which the orthopedic specialist is the key clinician for both the assessment and for potential therapeutic invention, interventions in response to its occurrence. Certainly, orthopedics should be consulted for cases with extensive disease, including those uh, with concern uh, for involvement of the growth plate, and also definitely for all of those uh, with uh, um, subperiosteal abscesses because these would actually go to the operating room for drainage. Additionally, for all cases of osteomyelitis that have extended to involve the joint, orthopedic involvement is warranted, although they may still defer to the interventional radiologist. Given the severity and complexity of MRSA in osteomyelitis, orthopedics should be routinely consulted even in those cases where the blood culture is positive so that a bone biopsy may not seem necessary to confirm the etiology of osteomyelitis. In our experience, these children frequently end up going to the operating room on multiple occasions, as you mentioned in, uh, as an outcome in those studies, and we really want to have the orthopedic and, uh, surgeon involved to assure that we get adequate source control. Okay. That, that sheds some light on. Thank you. Now, Kingelai Kinge, um, this is a topic, you know, we discussed it within our group, and there was, it was really popular in the literature a few years ago. I know it doesn't grow well on regular agar. Do you recommend sending it with all osteomyelitis, and if not, when? Uh, 
So King Alakingi eye is an important potential cause of osteomyelitis, but infection due to this pathogen is usually only seen in the younger child. Accordingly, we would not recommend doing specialized culture techniques for children greater than five years of age. For those younger than this, uh, consideration can be given to doing these cultures, although this is quite challenging for bone specimens. While we would routinely recommend that a portion of a joint aspirate from a young child with suspected septic arthritis be placed in back tech or other liquid blood culture media, um, this is not easily done for bone specimens, especially for spa small specimens obtained by the interventional radiologist. Since Kingella uh, kingii is very susceptible to first-generation cephalosporins like cephazolin, our practice is to use the cephalosporin for culture-negative osteomyelitis, especially in the younger child, to assure that we are covering this agent. Besides obvious sepsis and instability, would you ever recommend starting empiric antibiotic therapy for a patient with suspected osteomyelitis on night one? So the answer to this question really has to do with how stable the patient is. And in answering this question, I'll also talk about what my empiric therapy might be. Clearly, we prefer to have a definitive uh, organism because then we can use the appropriate, um, most narrow and most appropriate antibiotic for a given child. It better informs uh, decision-making about the transition to oral therapy, and it would be ideal if we had an organism in every case. Accordingly, you get the blood culture, and if we're really suspecting osteo in a child who's uh, clinically stable, maybe only has low-grade temperatures, but is not uh, very toxic or ill, one can wait and try to get a tissue specimen either by the orthopedic surgery team or by the interventional radiologist. However, there are times where the child may seem more ill with high-grade fever. With the high-grade fever, they're uncomfortable. They may have tachycardia. There may, they may look sick enough that one is interested in, in treating. So in those cases, empiric therapy is likely warranted. And of course, the question is, what empiric therapy would you use at that time? And the answer to that really does depend on your local epidemiology. In the time before prevalence of community-associated uh, MRSA as a cause of uh, osteomyelitis, this is a relatively simple answer. In that scenario, mostly what you needed to think about covering was methicillin-susceptible staph aureus, group A strep, and in the younger child, Kingella. And in our center, we would use intravenous cephazolin. However, in the post-CA uh, MRSA era, this decision can be more confusing. And while it may seem simple and a great idea to just generically use clindamycin, because it does cover the vast majority of community-associated isolates of MRSA, the concern there is that resistance rates uh, in excess of 20% uh, against clindamycin for methicillin-susceptible staph aureus have been quite common. Thus, while you might be adequately covering MRSA, you might be missing MSSA. Going to vancomycin as an alternative would uh, obviate the concern of missing the MSSA isolate, but for those um, patients in whom you get no organism and you only have clinical response as your answer, if you start vancomycin or if you start clindamycin, you get no organism in there improve, it becomes more challenging to use cephazolin and then transition to cephalexin. And so for this reason, we have typically thought that a, a careful history and examination, a historical evaluation for risk factors for MRSA may identify those who are okay to get cephazolin alone. So if the child or someone in the family have a history of uh, being known to be colonized or infected with MRSA, or if there's a history of recurrent skin and soft tissue infections in the child or the family, we are more concerned and likely to recommend uh, use with either clindamycin or uh, vancomycin. If the child is reasonably stable, 
and yet we want to start empiric therapy, or even in those kiddos that we wait until the biopsy is obtained, and then we're starting therapy once the culture is now cooking, but you don't have the result back, and who has no history suspicious for or concerning for the possibility of MRSA, will probably go ahead and start cefazolin. In the child that is ill, and particularly after we've gotten our specimen, we may be more likely to start vancomycin or clindamycin. But again, the concern always with clindamycin is this 20% resistance rate in uh, isolates of community-associated methicillin-susceptible uh, staph aureus. So it can be challenging at time. I'd say the vast majority of consults that I do, if I'm asked about initiation of therapy and a child just being admitted, and there's an absence of risk factors, I'm going to suggest using cefazolin. And in the child that's very sick, toxic appearing, the child in the intensive care unit setting, I'm probably more likely to use vancomycin because I don't want to worry about missing MRSA and having cefazolin fail and missing clindamycin-resistant MSSA and have the child fail uh, from that. Now, if our M community acquired MRSA rate, before I ask, do you know our community acquired MRSA rate? I don't know. Are the are you mean our clindamycin susceptibility? No, no. community acquired MRSA rate. Yeah, so I don't know it uh, precisely here. I believe that um, less than ten percent of our uh, osteomyelitis that are admitted to this hospital are attributable to community acquired uh, MRSA. I know that at other centers that can be much higher, and so there really is geographic variability in Texas for a period of time. That's where you were seeing thirty-five to fifty percent of cases. In Pittsburgh, to my experience, we've always been in the range of about 10% or less. So because our community-acquired MRSA rates are so low, if there's no personal history uh, for the patient to have MRSA, family member with MRSA, physicians, obviously their kids, and their health care workers' children, you're comfortable starting with cefazolin because of this high MSSA resistance rate to clindamycin. If our community-acquired MRSA rate was higher, like in Texas or California or even Jersey, I would assume you'd be less comfortable. So I think that that's probably true. The other caveat, though, is that we believe that the child with uh, osteomyelitis due to CA MRSA is more likely to be bacteremic and more likely to have uh, a positive uh, culture on biopsy. And therefore, you're more likely to confirm that, yes, this is uh, uh, MRSA or it's not. I think in those centers um, where the rates of MRSA are high, and actually even in our center with a 10% incidence, we have strongly uh, recommended attempting to get an organism on essentially all patients with osteomyelitis. And so fever, uh, limp, and a positive MRI is not an indication for antibiotic alone, but rather an indication for bone specimen followed by uh, antibiotic. And again, if it is MRSA, we believe that the likelihood that you're going to get a proven pathogen is greater than uh, because of uh, its enhanced virulence. It's greater likelihood to be associated with not only bacteremia, but sustained bacteremia. It's greater likelihood to be associated with persistent active infection that requires the uh, orthopedic surgeon to do multiple debridements in the operating room, you're just more likely to get a positive culture. And again, to summarize, to, to uh, accentuate the point, a sick patient, an unstable patient, a toxic-looking patient, right to vancomycin. Yes. And, and I, I think that that's a safe thing to do. You take care of the patient first, and then... Um, as one is now at the three or four days, five days later, the patient is better, you have no positive cultures, 
and you're making your decision about what antibiotic to use, do you stay on IV? Do you stay with vancomycin? Do you transition to IV clindamycin? Do you go to an oral therapy? That's one where the um, ID uh, consultation is particularly useful. And in fact, I can't even tell you what always informs my decision making because I sort of put all the pieces of information together in the context of that child, in the context of what I felt was their um, pre-admission risk for MRSA based on the epidemiologic risk that we've already discussed, and then I make a recommendation. But if there's ever a doubt, I'm going to be conservative and get it right, even if that means that I'm going to be either treating the patient with a stronger antibiotic, potentially a more toxic antibiotic, um, uh, and, um, and, and just make the decision to be safe. And I guess the final caveat would be is that in my opinion, you don't get to that eight-week course of treatment for MRSA osteomyelitis in a patient in whom you don't prove that they have MRSA osteomyelitis. Yeah. So the specimen is important. In the words of many individuals, but particularly one of my dear colleagues here, tissue is the issue. Tissue is the issue. And that's your last corny joke. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Now, I'm going to add one more uh, question. Do you think with the next version of the IDSA guidelines for MRSA, there's going to be a little bit more guidance for osteomyelitis, or do you think they're going to remain somewhat vague? So... I, I suspect that while there will have been additional accrued experience with the treatment and outcome of uh, community-associated MRSA osteomyelitis in children, to my knowledge, we're not seeing individuals do randomized uh, trials. So in some ways, the publication of the IDSA guideline calling for eight weeks of therapy may predict that children are going to get a minimum of eight weeks of therapy. Therefore, it will be hard to say that you don't need eight weeks of therapy, particularly even for those cases of CA MRSA that were less complicated, that did not require multiple uh, uh, trips to the operating room, that either were not associated with bacteremia or were not associated with sustained bacteremia. So on the one hand, one could um, uh, hypothesize and propose that those cases may not need the prolonged uh, duration of treatment that's in the IDSA guideline. But once a guideline has been published, and in the absence of data that says that its, uh, um, its recommendations are unnecessarily strict, it may be that individuals will be afraid to generate data using less ex uh, intense treatment and for fear that if the outcomes are suboptimal, they'll be sued, and that in the absence of such experience, that one is not going to um, come up with any new information that allows one to shorten the course of therapy. So um, I suspect that we will not see a lot of clarification, i.e. the duration of treatment. We may see some enhanced recommendations about when it is safe to go to oral therapy versus IV therapy. And we may see some uh, enhancement of the depth of data supporting which agent to use as the optimal agent, both for IV and also for oral therapy. And in particular, um, you mentioned the drug daptomycin as an IV agent. And I think what probably makes it most attractive is the fact that not only is it once a day, but I think more importantly, one does not have to pay attention to levels. And since for levels for um, important MRSA infections of vancomycin, we're really in the 15 to 20 range, and that the therapeutic uh, threshold for toxicity 
is a little bit above 20, the, the index, the therapeutic index of safety using vancomycin appropriately for MRSA bone infection can be quite small. So I think there'll be increasing data uh, on the use of daptomycin, and it may be that the daptomycin becomes the preferred agent and that vancomycin as a second-line therapy due to its uh, more challenging issues related to toxicity and also multiple doses. That was a great answer. Thank you, Mike. I want to, I want to thank you, Mike, for coming and uh, being on the podcast. I sincerely appreciate your help. So the take-home points, the summary points for this podcast are, number one, Staph aureus is the most common bacterium for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. For diagnosis, MRI with gadolinium is still the test of choice. Roughly 40 to 50% of times when you're trying to diagnose osteomyelitis, especially acute hematogenous osteomyelitis, a blood culture will be positive, and it may be your only source of finding out the organism. In terms of treatment, we have made the case for early transition to oral therapy, and by early we mean after two to four days of IV therapy for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis in pediatrics. In a patient who does not meet the exclusion criteria in the articles we discussed. We have discussed how MRSA is a more virulent organism for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis, or for that matter, osteomyelitis in general, and you should expect a higher uh, ASR and CRP and an increased likelihood of needing surgical procedures. So getting infectious disease con con consultant involved at that point could be helpful. I'm going to wrap this up now, so I'd like to give an acknowledgement to uh, Dr. Megan Keen Tarcici, who helps me in many, many things, uh, to my fellow DRG faculty for assisting me with questions for Dr. Green. Again, thank you to Dr. Michael Green, who was kind enough to be on this podcast. And thank you to all of you who are listening. My next podcast is going to be likely on UTI in a neonate with bacteremia, and I may branch out and con cover uh, UTI in general. But this is not set in stone, so that may be up in the air. So we shall see. If you have a topic you'd like me to cover uh, pertaining to pediatric hospital medicine, please shoot me an email and let me know. I'll be happy to consider it. Thank you again very much, and Happy New Year to everybody.